Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge in the nation's capital tonight, and this is The National. Lots and lots of crowds, and lots and lots of fun, and awesome fireworks. Anticipation bills for Canada's 150th. Our kids are growing up and they're learning about Canada and their history, so we just wanted to be a part of it. Downton Abbey, what did this place have to do with the birth of Canada? We'll tell you. You'll meet three young politicians keen to shape Canada's future. Why can't we look at politics in a different way? No, that's radical. Plus, Vancouver wasn't sure it could celebrate Confederation, given what it meant for Indigenous peoples. They didn't want us here. They wanted us gone. Then it found a way. Well, it's a view that always makes you feel an extra little bit of love for this country. Parliament Hill in the evening just makes you feel lucky to be Canadian. We tend not to talk outwardly or very aggressively about patriotism in this country. It's just not the Canadian thing to do. But it's there in so many of us, especially at this time of year. Even in the rain today, the area on and around Parliament Hill was busy. Moods much brighter than the skies. Happy birthday, Canada. Yay! <laughs> that despite ominous reminders everywhere that in 2017, any big public gathering could be a target. There were hints of what's to come tomorrow. Let's hear it again for Gordon Lightfoot, one of the greatest singer-songwriters ever, a true national treasure. And that's also a hint of what we have ahead on this program. So, let's get right to it with the CBC's Catherine Cohen. Catherine, you've been looking into the final preparations. Peter, this is supposed to be a great big party. As many as half a million people are expected. Years of planning have gone into this, but there are still a few issues cropping up. Tomorrow, it'll be a lot more crowded. Some are already gearing up. Check out those chairs. The Campbells from Sudbury, Ontario, take their Canada Day very seriously. There's lots in here. Rain pants for my husband. Our camera, sweaters, a cushion so we can lay back and have a nap. <laughs> it's the rain gear that may be the most crucial. Extra special fireworks, performances by U2's Bono and The Edge, Cirque du Soleil, Gordon Lightfoot and more any and all of them facing the threat of thunderstorms. The Singh sisters came prepared with their red rain jackets. And do you think, you think you're going to need that tomorrow? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sonia Singh says this was something they didn't want to miss. Once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, we have, our kids are growing up and they're learning about Canada and their history. So we just wanted to be a part of it. Then there's security at levels Canada Day has never quite seen. Organizers are strongly encouraging people to come two to three hours early for airport-style security screening. The police presence will be hard to miss. Well, large crowds and lots of police officers and lots of security. I think uh, we all acknowledge that we live in a different world today. There's going to be security and long lineups, but people should be feeling at ease. This is our Parliament Hill to all Canadians. In fact, who Parliament Hill belongs to is a sore point. Demonstrators have erected what they call a reoccupation teepee. Today, the Prime Minister visited with his wife. Here in this seat of government, we need to have space for you. There's not a lot that he could promise outright. I'm, I think that we are glad that he did come. We want to be on our land. We want to, we want to protect our land. And like, um, we want to be heard. I think we're safe there. Whatever goodwill that visit created seemed to disappear later in the day. RCMP refused to let demonstrators set up a large tent near the teepee to keep dry. But a compromise was reached and tensions seemed to subside. So the challenges range from massive issues that touch the core of what this country is all about to more banal stuff like the weather. But even in the face of all that, there are still expected to be hundreds of thousands of people in this city tomorrow looking to celebrate Canada 150. Peter. All right, Catherine, thank you. The Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall spent day two of their Canadian tour in southeastern Ontario. 
The first stop was CFB Trenton. Charles and Camilla met with soldiers and honored those killed in Afghanistan. Later, crowds welcomed them in Wellington. They toured a winery and farmer's market, hearing all about the village's farm-to-table philosophy. But their day came full circle when they met one person in particular. Anna Thibodeau has that story. Retired Master Corporal William Hawley and his wife, Carolyn Guy, have been anxiously awaiting this day. Hawley had a chance to thank Prince Charles and to talk turkey. Well, I, I said the proper greeting, uh, hello, your royal highness, and then he said, oh, I hear you're doing marvelous things with turkeys, which immediately knocked me back. Oh. Holly is a graduate of the Prince's Operation Entrepreneur Program that helps veterans transition to civilian life. In Holly's case, that transition has led him from the battlefield to the farmer's field. Holly served in the military for 30 years and was deployed in a tank regiment on two overseas tours. The job took a toll on his physical and mental health. He was medically released last February. I have all the, the mental issues that any normal and compassionate human has when they see what we see. And this is natural chicken behavior. His new life, free-range poultry and organic vegetables. A lot of it, it's like the military, because you're always fighting. You're always fighting something. You're fighting the weather, you're fighting the lack of water, you're fighting because there's too much water. But Holly knew he couldn't pay the bills unless he sold his goods. So he began training in a new type of boot camp through the Prince's charity, taking an accelerated business course, which gave him the confidence he needed to transition to his post-military career. One of the things that really drags you down when you got mental luggage from the army is what's the point? Why bother? Nobody cares. And I'll tell you, that week it was, everybody cares. The royal family's relationship with the military has existed for as long as the monarchy itself. That's why the prince and the duchess have chosen to focus today on Canadian troops and their families. When they see uh, members of the royal family engaging with Canadian military regiments, undertaking philanthropic initiatives in Canada, that, that this gives the public a sense of how this is Canada's royal family. For Holly, that connection with Prince Charles is now personal. I know he's not sitting it in his house at night saying, gee, I wonder how William Holly's farm is doing. But by the same token, his endorsement and belief in the program is kind of like a belief in me. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, CFB Trenton. Tomorrow, thousands of people will start their Canada Day by taking the oath of citizenship. They come from all walks of life, looking to plant roots and find a place to call home. Today, some soon-to-be Canadians shared their stories. Here's Carolyn Dunn. Since 2008, Andrea McCready has been the musician behind the carillon bells that ring out from the Peace Tower. Tomorrow, the U.S.-born retired physician will play the anthem for the crowd on Parliament Hill, then moments later, become Canadian. And from the get-go, I dreamed of playing O Canada on Canada Day and then coming down out of the tower and swearing in as a new uh, citizen. For the best of all possible Canada Days, Canada's 150th, I get to do it. So does Harish Parekh of Halifax. Ten years ago, he came to Atlantic Canada from India to study nursing. The sole purpose initially was uh, to get the higher education. But Parekh says he fell in love with the natural beauty of Canada, as well as the health care and social safety net that for him defines Canadian values. Still, it's the stereotypical politeness that really stands out. People's way of saying the thank you and holding a door for you if they're in front of you. It, it, I think it's just the, the most amazing part, part of being Canadian, right? You know, you wouldn't see that anywhere else in the world, basically, right? Do you want more water? Uh, that's fine. Ahogo and Evelyn Osemogi wanted their kids to reach their full potential. They say that's why they moved to Calgary five years ago. The Osemogis have settled in well. Their fourth child was born in Canada. For them, Canada's diversity is its standout feature. It's not about where you're coming from. 
It's about where you're going. On the eve of being sworn in as Canadian citizens, the Osemogis are still grappling with one dilemma, whether to wear Western clothes or traditional Nigerian outfits to the ceremony. A big decision, knowing taking the citizenship oath this year has extra meaning. It's 150 years. It means a lot to yeah. me and my family. It means we're special. And they expect to feel even more so after they and their children swear their oath. That's going to make me and my family feel wanted. That's where we're part of Canada. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Indeed, Canada can mean something different to each of us. Just ask legendary musician Gordon Lightfoot. He spent the last 60 years drawing inspiration from the landscape and people of this country. I caught up with Lightfoot just ahead of his performance tomorrow. I started by asking him how it feels to be back here. It feels really good. It's exciting. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm eager to do this. I, I, I thought the song was appropriate. Well, if you could read my mind, I, I, I think it's my, uh, is my best ballad. I have others that are, are good, but I think that one's sort of if I, if I do it second to last in my show, it, it tells me something. You yeah. made the conscious decision to stay in Canada. I mean, you could have gone any number of times. Yeah, I, I was invited to go uh, a couple of times to, it, 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 in a way that would have probably have enhanced my career, but I didn't care to have it enhanced any further than it was right now because I like to sort of like keep a, a low profile. We, could, we do. We, we haven't done a very good job of doing that, Peter, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> we were listening to you rehearsed there a few minutes ago, and it still sounds as pure as it ever did. Well, I, I, can, I, I can still crank it. I, I, I enjoy it. I, I, it it's, I, I'm lucky, you know. I, 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 I wouldn't believe, actually, that I could have sustained, you know, for this amount of time. Uh, uh, I'm 78 years of age, and to, but, Young. But, but you got to stay prepared. Like I say, you got to keep moving. And, and I exercise. Well, a lot of people can't do it. They don't have time. They can't put it in their, their schedules. But uh, I, I do it anyway. I, I go out to do it. Well, tomorrow, we'll, uh, Canadians from coast to coast to coast will be watching you again and trying to read your mind. Yeah, I'll be aware. I will. I'll be, I'll be thinking about every last one of them while I'm doing it, believe me. <laughs> it's a big show. It's a great big show. I know it. And, and I'm really happy to be a part of it and uh, to, to be invited to do it, you know? So. It's great, sir. All right. It's always a thrill. Thanks so much. Yep. Coming up. This stately English home had the title role in Downton Abbey. It also played a role in the birth of Canada. So I'm sure that all your founding fathers walked up these stairs. <laughs> well, after a roller coaster few weeks, there's big political change in British Columbia. Christy Clark's fragile liberal government came crashing down last night after it was defeated in a confidence vote. Now the NDP, backed by the Green Party, will take a turn at the wheel. Briar Stewart has more on what's next. On the grounds of the legislature, they're getting ready to mark an important moment in Canada's history. But inside this building, the focus is very much on the future. A new provincial government led by NDP leader and now Premier designate John Horgan. Rise and stay standing to be counted. Last night, the NDP and Green Party brought down the government, ending 16 years of Liberal rule and Christy Clark's time as Premier. I wish them very much the best and I hope it goes well for them. For weeks, Clark and her team tried to hang on, but in the end, her minority was toppled when the Green Party struck a deal with the NDP. You have an understanding with the BC NDP. If there are issues that, that we can't agree on, you know, we'll, we'll do so. We're looking at bills on a case-by-case -case basis. How does Premier designate sound, John? Sounds fine. After weeks of political maneuvering, many in the public are relieved there's some certainty, at least for now. Very pleased at the, at the possibilities of, of a genuine collaboration. Now, I'm also happy as a minority because I want a government that works together. Today, the man who will soon lead this province outlined his priorities. 
arranging to go to Washington to talk about softwood lumber. We're going to be working with Ottawa on, on fentanyl. We're going to be talking with the federal government about the challenges uh, around childcare. For now, the focus is on appointing a new cabinet. Once the NDP government is sworn in, it will work on drafting a throne speech and a budget. It's expected that the next legislative session will begin in September. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Victoria. New numbers from the BC Coroner's Service show a slight dip in drug overdose deaths between April and May this year, but fatalities are still far above what they were last year. A total of 129 people died from drug use last month, or about four a day. Most of those deaths involve fentanyl. Four out of five were male. December remains the deadliest month on record in BC with 159 confirmed fatalities. It's been a frustrating day for many Canadians trying to send or receive money online. Technical problems have plagued Interact's e-transfer service. Customers started complaining last night that it didn't work. Today, the big banks and several credit unions confirmed that they were affected. Interact temporarily took the service offline to figure out the problem. Canadians sent over $63 billion with e-transfer last year. Straight ahead, Sir John A. Macdonald and Downton Abbey. There are very few degrees of separation. The National with Peter Mansbridge. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Well, we are a long way from our usual cozy studio tonight. It's about 3,000 kilometers that way. This is the Northwest Passage. We're in a shaft of the old syndicate coal mines here in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. These are unusual surroundings for the National. We're about an hour north of Fort McMurray from Stratford, Ontario in Delta, British Columbia. From Parliament Hill in Saskatoon. Going live off the deck of an icebreaker in Vancouver. From Montreal, once again tonight, a city at the heart of a crisis in the cold. Do you worry about the ice? Yes, I do, yeah. Um, what's gonna happen if it all melts, melts away? Oh, jolly we minor men, and minor men are we. They've all worked the coal mines in Cape Breton. Now they sing to preserve the heritage and the folklore of the island's mining communities. <laughs> Canada is still here tonight, but just barely. Quebecers have voted no to sovereignty. But of course, the story the whole world is watching is the historic switch to the year 2000. This is the day that Winnipeg has been waiting for worrying about, even dreading. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge from downtown Toronto. For the most part, an eerily dark Toronto. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge inside Vatican City. Good evening from the Netherlands, Baghdad. In Tiananmen Square tonight from London. In Vimy Ridge, France. From Kandahar, Afghanistan. Here in Berlin, there's another opening in the wall tonight, number 22. When the waves crashed ashore here and they didn't have far to come, there's the beach line. Our ride today is on an Israeli Air Force Black Hawk helicopter. That is the area that the suicide bombers used to get to some of their targets. Look at those. Those are the papal apartments just over on the other side. That's where the Pope lives. As night falls, we're back on the road, moving through the streets of Kandahar, and as always, on the lookout. Thanks for watching. Well, there's something eternally romantic about castles, especially those grand old stone structures that adorn the English countryside. So why are we talking English castles the day before Canada Day? Well, one has a very strong connection to Confederation. Without it and its resident Earl, it's possible the compromises that led to the British North America Act would not have happened. Nala Ayed has the story. 
oh, the stories this castle could tell. Witness to more than 300 years of stories and one epic yarn about the building of a nation. In the long memory of High Clear Castle, one year stands out, 1866. And among its many visitors, one name stands out. He was one John A. MacDonald. He would have arrived here, been quite cold, not a good time of year, a great big fire roaring in the library and one next door. They'd have gone for some walks around the garden. Lady Carnarvon's home might best be known as the setting for Downton Abbey, but in its diaries and letters, she discovered an intriguing Canadian chapter. I was just so excited. I just couldn't believe it. I thought, how lucky are we to have something so momentous taking place in this library, round the dining room table. So these are the main stairs which go up to many of the bedrooms. So I'm sure that all your founding fathers walked up these stairs. <laughs> It was here that some of those founding fathers made the final compromises on the making of Canada. Their host, then, was Henry Herbert, the fourth Earl of Carnarvon, and the Secretary of State for the Colonies. The time for union is now. I ask you to take the dare. After the conferences at home on Confederation, there was to be a final London conference before a bill on the Canadian Union goes to the British Parliament. John A. Macdonald would again be the star, but he arrived in London months late, dividing his time between the Westminster Palace Hotel, where he chaired the conference, and the Athenaeum, a gentleman's club. This, by many accounts, had been for him a heavy drinking year. The other crucial character, Lord Carnarvon. Much of the cajoling happened in his library. Discussions by the fire would go on for hours. MacDonald, Cartier and others contemplating the kind of country Canada could be. So he was without doubt the expeditious driving force in the middle to bring people together to take it forward. So this is your country in 1864. They imagined the railway talked minority education rights, absent though was the voice of Canada's First Nations. And it hasn't really changed since John A was here. Same carpet, same table, same chairs. Here, Carnarvon and Macdonald would become lifelong friends. There was, though, the matter of Macdonald's drinking, noted in the Lord's diaries. But their work went on. And finally, on February 12th, Lord Carnarvon introduced the Canada Bill at Westminster while Macdonald watched. We are laying the foundation of a great state, he told lawmakers, perhaps one which at a future day may even overshadow this country. And there's a note from John A. Macdonald who was sitting in the gallery listening to Lord Carnarvon, um, who made a speech for an hour and a half about the wonders of Canada and what he was proposing. And John A. Macdonald thought it was a wonderful speech. Just four days later, Macdonald sealed his heady time here with another union at London's St. George's Church. Susan Agnes Bernard became his second wife. On the certificate, his signature appears again. For Canada, this would be the more crucial document. The British North America Act passed quietly, with little debate. Inside you can see Lorraine Levolt. Queen Victoria gave royal assent on March 29, 1867. It wasn't yet Canada as we know it, but had many of its fundamentals. The original lives in the Act Room of the Parliamentary Archives. I had to say it was kind of awesome because, um, it, as I say, it means the document means so much to people, and having responsibility for its custody is, I guess, in many ways, a, a privilege. On July 1st, Canada was created. John A. Macdonald was knighted, and on the true story of the final compromises, the castle still holds the secrets. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Newbury, England. Well, that was the birth of Canada. Up next, we look to its future.
I hope that in 50 years, when looking back, that people can say we got it right. Three young politicians eager to make a difference. We'll see what they have in mind. The reality for Indigenous people is people are dying while we're having these celebrations. Plus, Vancouver finds a path to inclusion. Time to check today's business numbers. The TSX fell 31 points. The dollar increased a quarter of a cent. In New York, the Dow gained 62 points. The price of oil closed up a dollar 11 a barrel. Hello, folks. Our last Facebook Live, at least between me and you. So let's get right to it. Some uh, questions coming in here on our location in Ottawa, overlooking uh, Parliament Hill, the Peace Tower. They, if you hear some music going on in the background, it's uh, some of the rehearsals that are going on for tomorrow night's show. Uh, we can't show them to you because of various contract agreements with the artists. No go on rehearsals. Uh, so anyway, here we go with some questions. Magda uh, Igluski asks, Peter, what do you wish for Canada's 150? Well, I think I wish what everybody wishes, that we, uh, that we have the ability to celebrate what we have uh, and address the issues that are still to be resolved. So it's a combination of, uh, of both those. Paul Glushu asks, or Gushu, Paul, are you a Gushu from Newfoundland? Great curlers. Brad. Uh, Paul asks, what gave you the drive to uh, do what you've done for almost 50 years? Well, like most journalists, you know, I'm fascinated by what goes on around me. I love asking questions, you know, challenging assumptions and trying to take that information that we gain and bring it to you. We'll let you uh, resolve in your own mind how you want to feel about those things. Uh, so really, uh, you know, that is a lot of fun to do those things. And for most journalists, it's, uh, it's why they do what they do. Uh, Jen in Ottawa asks, what song do you have for your phone's ringtone? Uh, I don't know what song I have for my phone's ringtone. Um, but I take it, eh? The default. I have the default tone. Um, but if I could figure out how to put in any of uh, the hip songs, I'd, I'd do that. Uh, DC asks, who was your biggest inspiration over the years? Oh boy, there have been a lot. A lot of, uh, a lot of my colleagues have inspired me uh, to do great work. You know, one of them was David Halton, who, who helped put together um, a piece on me last, that was on the journal, or on the journal, on the national last night. Uh, I didn't see it last night because I was at my son's graduation. I hadn't seen it in preparation. I saw it this morning and it was fantastic and having David be involved in it meant so much uh, to me as well. So he, he inspired me, Knowlton Nash inspired me, Joe Schlesinger, uh, but many of our current journalists inspire me too to do the kind of work that we do. You know, Adrian, Nala Ayed, who you just saw, uh, Paul Hunter in Washington. And I don't just say that because he's standing on the roof about 20 feet from me here. Um, but, but he does. Uh, Heather Clements asks, how many prime ministers have you interviewed? I've interviewed every prime minister since John Diefenbaker. Now, he wasn't the prime minister at the time, but uh, both Diefenbaker and Pearson, uh, who had both stepped down from the prime ministership, uh, I had an opportunity to, to interview them, and every uh, prime minister in office since that time. So there have been uh, quite a few. Chelsea Lamp, how much time? 45 seconds? About 30 seconds. 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Chelsea Lamp asks, if you could send a message to the entire world, what would you say in 30 seconds? <laughs> well, I had 30 seconds, but now I don't. Uh, you know, look at Canada. You know, there are issues we have. We're trying to address them, but we're a pretty good country to stand for a lot of good things. And so I'd say, look at Canada. This has been a lot of fun doing Facebook Lives. I thank you for your questions. Stay with us. More to come on The National. Two seconds.
Well, let's face it, there's been a lot of build-up to tomorrow's Canada Day. Milestone birthdays have a way of encouraging that. But what about July 2nd? What should Canada and Canadians be thinking about then and going forward into the next 150? We gathered three young political leaders to pick their brains. First, a little background on how they rose to their positions. Lindell Smith is a community activist who never saw himself as a politician until last fall when he was elected to Halifax's city council in a landslide. Mama, we did it. <laughs> Becoming the first Afro Nova Scotian councillor in 16 years. Gabriel Nadeau Dubois never planned on getting into politics either. He became a household name in Quebec as the face of students against tuition hikes in 2012. Now, he's traded his carré rouge for another uniform, bringing his fire and energy to Quebec's National Assembly as an MA for Quebec Solidaire. And until last year, you may not have heard of Karina Gould. In the last federal election, she won her riding of Burlington, Ontario, ousting a longtime incumbent. She's a recent addition to Justin Trudeau's cabinet. I, Karina Gould, do solemnly and sincerely promise and declare. And the youngest female minister in Canadian history. So there used to be a time when young people got into politics, a lot of them, because they thought it was the best way to affect change. Not so much anymore, but you three have. So I want to get a sense from you as, as to why you chose politics to affect change. Uh, well, I think because it is the best way to affect change. If you want to have your voice heard, you need a seat at the table. And so for me, when I got involved, it was because I saw the country going in a direction that, you know, I didn't think myself or my peers wanted to go into. But so many of the people in your generation have kind of run away from this as an option for change. Well, I think that it's important to demonstrate that you can be successful as a young person in politics. And, you know, it's like anything, it's hard, it's a lot of hard work, but at the same time, I think, you know, the three of us here have demonstrated that if you're willing to put your name forward, if you're willing to step up, if you're willing to go out and listen to people, you can bring those ideas and those voices to whichever level of government you're participating in. And it's hard, it's a long game. You're not going to make a difference tomorrow. It might not be, you know, in six months from now, but you're part of the process. What about you, Lindell? You uh, you want to affect change like now. You don't <laughs> want to wait six months or a year, you want now. Yeah, it's, so part of it is wanting it now, but then also knowing with the way that our government uh, system works, it does take time. Um, and you really have to, to really think about how can I do that in a way that I might affect change now, but also look towards the future. Mm -hmm. When, what, I, what I really think is important as well is if you look at us, we're three different individuals in terms of what a politician should be. Yeah. Um, we don't fit the bill and I think that is really important for Canada to see that you don't need to be the old style of a politician to be at the table and make the changes. As I tell young people, or to be in the tent. Because you know, sometimes we are, as young, as young people wanting to see change, we like to kick the tent and not let you build it, but we don't sometimes want to sit inside it. You've said that nothing about you bleeds politician. But you are... That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought until, until I got into it. And a politician doesn't mean somebody who um, has scandal or somebody who uh, will smile and kiss babies. A politician can also be somebody who, who fights against the system and also wants to make sure that their, their, their residents, their constituents are represented, which to me is important. Well, Lindell pointed at you, Gabrielle, and on fighting the system, there's no mm -hmm. question you did that. Yep. Uh, you were a disruptor and you affected change. Yep. But you chose to get out of the disruption business and come into the political business. Well, I, I think those two businesses are, can, you know, can work together. And I, I, I often say I don't see myself yet as a politician, but, but more as an activist doing politics. And I'm part of a, of a party which has always thought this way, you know. We, we see, and I see politics, and being a, a member of the National Assembly of Quebec as a way like another to, uh, to change uh, Quebec society. 
Have any of your supporters from the old days come up to you and said, wow, you've sold out. You joined the other side. You're on the dark side now. Um, a few, but there, there's a lot more of young people that were in the streets in 2012 with me that came to me and that told me, you are just taking the next step in the same fight that we fought together. You all want to talk about change to some degree, that there are changes you want to see happen. My, I, I'm assuming, seeing as you come from different backgrounds, you represent uh, different ideals in many ways, that there's not an agreement here on the change. So I want, to, I, I want to try and get some sense of how you see the need for this country to change as we enter sort of a next milestone area after 150. What has to happen for Canada now? One of the biggest things for me, um, and we're already seeing, is, is representation uh, from all backgrounds. So I come from Nova Scotia, Halifax, mm -hmm. uh, a large history in terms of the African Nova Scotia community. We've been there, so my ancestors go back 400 years um, in Nova Scotia. Uh, so before Canada was Canada, uh, my ancestors were, were, were there on that land. And even thinking back historically to our First Nations who were here 4,000 years ago, uh, before before Canada. So me, I look at the sense of if we have representation of what Canada is, because Canada is is a diverse, mm -hmm. diverse country and our, 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 our communities that we live in are so diverse. So if we're looking at our politics, they should represent where we come from. So one of the things that I see is that change of how do we get representation? How do we have people step up? So maybe we're not that different because <laughs> I think uh, that actually now that we're coming towards Canada 150th, that the number one change that we have to work towards is reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples. And part of that is also appreciating the inclusivity that we have in Canada, but working to continuously improve it and to ensure that that diversity that, you know, I think all of us agree with and all of us feel is really important continues and that we work to make sure that it's truly inclusive. I would ask three more, three main challenges that I think are the political task of, of my generation. The, the first one being, of course, climate change, which mm -hmm. is yeah. one of the big political challenges that humanity in itself <laughs> has faced in its history. The second one, I think, is wealth and income inequality, which is rising all over the world. It's rising also in Quebec and Canada. And the third one, for me, is the, the, revi the, the revival of the Quebec independence movement. I'm, I'm part of that movement and I think this project of Quebec's independence have to be um, redefined in order to really face the challenges of the 21st century. Yeah, I don't imagine we get a, a universal mm. agreement nodding Probably the not. head off. Not on the third <laughs> one. No. <laughs> Probably not. But it's a challenge for you who believe in it because it's, it's not there right now. It, no. You know, the support for that idea. Well, that, that, that's why I in say a lot it's of ways, the young yeah. people is not yeah. there. Right? Exactly. That's why I say it's a, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. But what we're seeing right now is a new generation of young Quebecers, Anglophones and Francophones um, together, um, starting to take back that project and redefine it on their own terms. Seeing it, for example, as the best way to build a new relationship with First Nations as the, seeing it as the best way to put in place strong and deep um, democratic reforms in Quebec. Does talk of independence in Quebec resonate at all with you, Lindell? Um, in, in the broader sense, no, because that's not something that, that's happening uh, with my community. That's something that I, I don't know much about in terms of, uh, it's never been an issue for, for my people, but the thing is, I love being educated. I think it's so important. So you just speaking about that, I want to know more. I want to know why you feel that should happen. I want to know why the young people are doing that. We're all colleagues. Um, no matter how you look at it, we, we, we're working to make our Canada better. So um, it might not be something close to me, but I'd be more than, than pleased to learn more about the issue. 50 years from now, yeah. the point of the next you know, kind of major anniversary, um, and people look back at your generation. You'll be the old guys then, right? <laughs> what do you want them to say about what you achieved? When we look at our political world, I feel we're still working in silos. So one of the things I want to see achieved is that when we look at our political environment, it's, yes, you might be a different party, we might have different views, but we sh that shouldn't allow us not to think how we're going to make Canada better. 
So what, what I envision is, is, is showing people that as an elected official, you can actually work with your different, different levels of government, no matter their party, um, and, and no matter what their beliefs are. At the end of the day, we want to be there for the people. And when we start seeing that shift, so maybe a certain party might control the house, but why can't uh, somebody take that portfolio, maybe another party that actually would really be beneficial to that issue? Uh, why can't we look at politics in a different way? Um, so, you know, for me, it's, it's, I, wanna, I want people to say, okay, Lindell, push the envelope of how politics looked for our city and maybe in Canada, who knows, 50 years from now. But for me, it's ha looking at, okay, he did that different. We can't go back to the old way of doing it. Now that's radical thinking. You must like that. Uh, yes, I do. And, 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 you know, I think we live in a pivotal time. Um, not only in Quebec and Canada, but all major democracies are really at, pivotal, uh, at a pivotal time. And we are seeing right now a, a, a very strong wind <laughs> um, affecting the, a, a lot of countries in, in terms of wanting major and deep system change. And I, I think 50 years from now, to answer your question, what I would like is to see that same phenomenon happen in Quebec and be part of it. Karina, you get the last word. I hope they say we got it right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, as was mentioned, we are at a critical juncture in history right now. And I hope that in 50 years, when looking back, that people can say we got it right. People were safe. We dealt with climate change responsibly. We ensured that people were included. We continued to work on that Canadian dream in terms of ensuring that you know future generations do better than previous generations, that we continue to have the freedoms and the rights that we have, whether it's democracy, the human rights, free speech, et cetera, that we, we don't have to, that when 50 years we don't say, we lost those things. And I think that we're at a moment, and you know, we're talking about uh, social change and upheaval in a time when people are questioning the direction that we're going in and they're questioning whether they belong and whether they feel part of the national and international project that the world has built. And so ultimately for me, I hope that in 50 years, they look back on our political leadership and say, they got it right. Well, it's uh, a long list. It's not an easy list. Mm -hmm. Politics but is it's hard. Not, <laughs> yeah, politics is hard. It's not an impossible list. But it's worth it. So, Thank you all uh, for doing this, and uh, we'll see you in 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank, thank you, you for your service. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank thank you, you for you. all that you've done. Yeah, well, coming up, Vancouver looks back beyond Confederation to make the celebration more inclusive. Uh, Cohen is a Canadian poet, novelist, and despite an air of frail vulnerability, he's a very confident young man. I feel free when I'm singing. Do you make up your own songs? Hmm. I uh, always thought of myself as a singer and uh, kind of got sidetracked into literature. Can you sing? Well, I think that if the song is really good and it's your own, then uh, what comes out is music. But now another stranger seems to want you to ignore his dreams as though they were the burden of another. Oh yes, well I'd feel pretty lousy if I were praised by uh, a lot of the people that have uh, come down pretty heavy on me. And I'd stay what I become, you much prefer the gentleman I was before. Well, I always felt that my work was more eccentric and uh, that uh, if it touched the mainstream from time to time, I would be lucky. I remember you well in the Chelsea Hotel. You were famous, your heart was a legend. All right, it is Mr. Leonard Cohen! You know, it's only in a country like this that I could get the male vocalist of the year. Well, I don't know, people have called me the pessimistic, you know, but I, I think the pessimist is someone who's, who's waiting for it to rain. 
you know, and I, I feel completely soaked to the skin. So. It's closer time. Sometimes I see myself in the midst of it, or I catch sight of myself in the mirror, you know, this old guy in his underwear, you know, kind of trying to find the rhyme for orange and, uh, you know, playing the same phrase on his guitar 15, 20, 90 times trying to get it right. And there's something uh, uh, absurd about that, but, uh, you know, the nature of work is repetition. And do you come up with a rhyme for orange? Uh, um, door hinge. As we saw earlier, this Canada Day is no cause for celebration for many Indigenous people. Some have brought their anger here to Ottawa, erecting a teepee to reoccupy Parliament Hill. Those kinds of feelings led the city of Vancouver to struggle with what to do around July 1st. Having declared itself a city of reconciliation back in 2014, it resisted embracing Canada 150, feeling it would be hypocritical. But then the city's own Aboriginal Executive Council stepped up and said it would find a way. And Canada 150 was born. 150 plus, that is. Nick Purden has that story. A one, two, three, four. Music has really, I think, opened up my mind. It's a way to connect not only to our own culture, but also connect to all different cultures, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from. In Bubba's man cave on Squamish First Nation, Tawani Joseph's band, Bitterly Divine, they're getting ready for the biggest gig of their career. They're part of Vancouver's celebration of Canada's birthday. We're a rock band that happens to be First Nations. And we've played gigs like that actually where people thought we would come in and be fully traditional. But at the same time, at the end of the show, people were screaming and, and yelling and, and wanted to be a part and hang out with us after and we wanted to hang out with them. And so you see that transformation within an hour, an hour and a half that actually happens. But for all the transformative power of music, the city of Vancouver was pretty close to not having any Canada 150 celebrations at all, until the indigenous community saved it. We're gonna have 25 canoes arrive from Ambleside. Ginger Gosnell Myers is Vancouver's first ever manager of Aboriginal relations. And she tells me she gets chills when she imagines this summer's canoe landing ceremony. They'll be invited to land on Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territory. When the federal government unveiled its plan for Canada 150, Ginger had a dilemma. Vancouver has the third highest indigenous population of any city in the country and had recently declared itself a city of reconciliation. It's not impossible. So how do you celebrate Canada? It was definitely awkward for us to understand how we as a city of reconciliation could meaningfully just celebrate 150 years. We know it goes deeper than that. For Indigenous peoples, the last 150 years isn't something worth celebrating. Would you have? I don't think I would have celebrated. 
I don't think I would have celebrated Canada 150. Like what are the things that make it personal and hard for you? It's really hard to look at Canada and say that they ever intended for me to be here today and that ever intended for our peoples to be alive and for our culture to be alive. They didn't want us here. They wanted us gone. I can't celebrate that. But instead of turning their backs on Canada 150, Vancouver's Aboriginal Advisory Committee came up with its own idea. Why don't we rebrand Canada 150 into Canada 150 plus, recognizing that if we're going to focus on Indigenous people's contributions to this country, we also have to acknowledge that we are older than just 150. We are 150 plus. And now Ginger's excited about Vancouver's year-long celebration of her culture and history. It means a lot just knowing that we're still here. And we're here because our ancestors were strong, they survived. Uh, and the next 150 years are going to look a lot different. Canoes have taught me uh, a patience and strength and uh, to keep uh, my heart open and to open to possibilities and open to new experiences. Rhiannon Bennett is counting down the days until she's part of the opening of Canada 150 Plus. Rhiannon will skip a canoe from the Musqueam Nation that will make a traditional landing on a Vancouver beach. It's in my blood, it's in part of who I am to, stay, to get in the canoe and to go and, and to, rem to remember how long those canoes and these waters and how important they are to my family. Sounds like you love them. I love them so much. Tell me why the canoe landing is important. So it's not just the canoe simply coming in and landing. It's going to be a very powerful statement to the greater community to remind them all that we are still here and we haven't gone anywhere. Rhiannon didn't want to have anything to do with Canada 150 before Vancouver's rebrand. It reminded her of how she's made to feel invisible in the middle of the city. It's far too often I can be standing in my own territory and people look at me and they go, they can see that I'm kind of brown and they see that I might be from somewhere, you know, a little different and they always, you know, where are you from? And I say here. And they're like, no, but where are you from? I'm from here. I'm from this land. I'm Musqueam. And they're like, Musqueam, what's that? Where's that? I'm like, it's the land that you're standing on right now. Back on the Squamish First Nation, Bitterly Divine works through their set. And Tawani tells me he's just tired of people putting him in a box. People seem to always want to place you into a place that was a long time ago, you know, and that's what they see. That's a wrap. And I think people hopefully will understand that we're more than just beads and feathers. And I think so how do you get rid of that kind of stereotype? Well, actually coming together and meeting one another helps. And in Vancouver in 2013, that's exactly what happened when Karen Joseph organized a Walk for Reconciliation. We wanted to make sure that Canadians, everyday Canadians, understood that reconciliation was not an Indigenous issue, that this was a Canadian issue. And why was walking important? Well, it, it was the symbolism of having a journey together, of recognizing that myself, my families, my communities, that we were trying to create a new way forward for Canadians, for Canada, together. Karen, who's now the CEO of Reconciliation Canada, had no idea if anyone would show up that day in 2013. But in the end, 70,000 people walked in the rain through the streets of Vancouver. It was like exhilarating. It was amazing, the energy that was, that was that the people carried that day, the, the power of that collective movement, that collective energy, was awe-inspiring. It, 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 it was a life-changing day for sure. And so what Karen wants for Canada's birthday is to do her part for reconciliation. And so she's organizing a new walk in September as part of Canada 150 Plus. What's at stake if the relationship doesn't get better? The reality for Indigenous people is people are dying while we're having these celebrations. And you can't just turn away from that every day and expect people not to get frustrated, not to feel defeated. And so this walk 
is going to be really, really important because July 1st is going to have come and gone. And we're going to need to know that people are committed to creating something better together following these celebrations, right? I truly believe that Canada will never fulfill its potential until Indigenous peoples are truly not only recognized, but are immersed in, into the fabric of what happens socially, economically um, in, this, in this country. And I think 150 plus represents the new beginning for where Canada is going. So maybe Canada 150 plus is an opportunity to think about how we can do better in the next 150 years. All right, let's take it from the top. Nick Purden, CBC News, from the Squamish First Nation. Up next, a final word from the National, right here in Ottawa. Each working day of the year throughout Canada, the post office handles about 10 million pieces of mail. The men who face the gigantic task of sorting this mass of mail must know the names of 13,000 cities, towns and villages in Canada. In the last decade, its reputation for quick, dependable service has been smashed by literally hundreds of labor disturbances. Its deficit has risen to an astonishing $600 million a year, and its automation program is so far behind schedule, no one can estimate when it'll be finished. Canadians are losing patience. They're increasingly fed up, and so am I. The post office will become a crown corporation. In rural communities across Canada, the post office is more than a place to buy stamps and pick up your mail, and this one is no exception. It's, it's really the center of the village. But Canada Post says it loses money. These new super boxes will replace Verna Dunlop. There's no contact with an, uh, an aluminum box and a key. We want to have a community life. About 30 groups of angry residents from across Canada kicked off a national campaign today to get rid of super mailboxes. Anne Derrett lives in Markham, just north of Toronto. She doesn't get home mail delivery. Every weekday, either she or her husband trudges about 100 meters to the neighborhood mailbox. Derrett hates that trek so much, she helped found RAM residents against mailboxes. Ram Mulrooney mailboxes. Well, the post office delivered something today it hasn't been able to for 30 years, a profit. Canada Post says it made almost $100 million in the past year and it expects even bigger profits in the future. Canadians are making fewer trips to the mailbox. This is the main culprit, email, now as mainstream as a Hollywood blockbuster movie convincing the millions of Canadians who use it to come back to so-called snail mail won't be easy. Why would I want to mail a letter and post it then go to the, mail, to the mailbox? Why? Big change for many Canadians. The end of home mail delivery in urban centres. On doorsteps across the country today, there came plenty of reaction to the big changes at Canada Post. I like to have things delivered and everyone cuts back and it's so silly. Like the milkman a generation or more ago, the days of daily visits from your friendly letter carrier will soon seem like a quaint notion from another era. The National. The National. Tonight. Well, you may have heard a hint of it behind me. There's a lot of people ready to make tomorrow a really big day. And we'll help you through all parts of Canada Day from Ottawa with coverage beginning at 6 a.m. Eastern, right through to the fireworks. I'll be with you starting at 10 a.m. Eastern. So, that's The National for this Friday night. For CBC News, I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching all these years. It's been quite the ride for me, but always a privilege 
to be a part of bringing the national story home to you from wherever that story may be. I can only hope you found it worthwhile too. Goodbye and good night from Ottawa.